Our scripture this morning comes from Ezekiel, chapter 34, verses 11 to 16. For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd cares for his herd in the day when he is among his scattered sheep, so I will care for my sheep and will deliver them from all the places to which they were scattered on a cloudy and gloomy day. I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and bring them to their own land. And I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, by the streams and in all the inhabited places of the land. I will feed them in good pasture and their grazing ground will be on the mountain heights of Israel. There they will lay down on good grazing ground and feed in the rich pastures on the mountains of Israel. I will feed my flock and I will lead them to rest, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost and bring back the scattered, bind up the broken and strengthen the sick, but the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them with judgment. It's the word of God for the people of God. And so today, before we begin our sermon, I have just a short little video um, that I want you guys to watch. And you may have seen this before, but I think it's very appropriate for today. The Bible says my king is the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. I wonder do you know him. My king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleans the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent. And he purifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. He's a key to knowledge. He's a well-trained of wisdom. He's a doorway of deliverance. He's a pathway of peace. He's a roadway of righteousness. He's a highway of holiness. He's a gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. So that's taken from a sermon by uh, S.M. Lockridge, 
And if you don't know, SM stands for Shadrach and Meshach. And so it was pretty predetermined, I think, for him what he was going to be doing with his life when he was born, right? Um, and I have to tell you, the thought of showing that and then trying to give my own sermon is pretty daunting. Um, because it's just unbelievable. You know, one of the things that, uh, that kids do on the, and we did when, uh, when I was in school, on the way to uh, like an away game when you're riding the bus is that you listen to music to kind of get yourself ready and hyped up for the game. And um, I can't think of a better thing to, to listen to right before you give a sermon every week to get yourself hyped up and ready to try and give your sermon. So, but a, a great thing to remind us all the wonderful things to describe Jesus Christ for us. So in our scripture today, we, uh, we find the prophet Ezekiel writing about how God will bring the Hebrews back together one day. You see, at this time in the lives of the Israelites, they were experiencing one of the many times that they had been conquered and scattered across the Middle East. This particular time was uh, the Babylonians had come in and taken them away. And as with other difficulties that they had endured, uh, this spreading out of one another, or diaspora being the 25-cent word for it, um, was brought on by them turning away from the Lord. So the cycle for the Israelites goes like this. Things are going great. The people turn away from God. They get conquered and scattered. God redeems them and brings them back together into their kingdom. And when we think about this splitting up and moving away from God as a society— I think we can draw some pretty good parallels for ourselves in the world today. So one of the things that I'm often asked or find myself in discussion with people about is, why is it that people have turned away from the church? Why is it that they're they're choosing now not to believe in Christ? Well, I wish there was an easy answer to this question. But first, I think it's important that we make a point here. Moving away from attending church does not necessarily mean that someone's moved away from Christ. Now, don't get me wrong. I do believe that the best place for a person to grow in their relationship with Christ is to be in a place with other people that are going to help and nurture and support that person to grow in their faith. And it's the utmost importance that a disciple of Christ have that ability to learn from other disciples of Christ. But there are people that you will find that love Jesus with all their heart, but they can't bring themselves to step through those doors for whatever reason. More often than this, I hear this. It's a problem with this generation. Now, I didn't specify which generation. And the people that I talk to usually don't specify which generation it is either. There's a thought that people of a certain age, whatever that group tends to be, have lost their ability to have faith. And while you can make the argument and point at numbers and say, look at this age group, they just don't go to church anymore. That doesn't help us explain why. It simply tells us that they do not. So just like the Israelites found themselves split apart over the Middle East in a physical way, I think we find ourselves split up in a spiritual way. We don't necessarily find that we are removed from one another by distance, though right now we do find ourselves at least six feet apart in distance. And it's not that there's an army that's come through and carried away our families, moving us to different parts of the world. But what we deal with right now is the gaps and the spaces that are formed between us and the ones that we love in a spiritual sense. Well, you might ask then, what is it that can bring these people back to the church or to the church for the first time? The answer to this is the love of Christ our King. So what does it mean to have Christ as our King? We need to think about what it means to have anyone as your King. Now, I know that the thought of having someone as your King, for we that are Americans— is not one that necessarily sits well when we consider it. And I have to tell you, when I thought about this week, what it meant to serve a king, it felt kind of odd to think about. After all, we haven't had a king here since 1776, and we fought two wars to make sure that we didn't have a king. 
But if we are to serve a king, then we are to acknowledge that there is one above us. There is one that has the ultimate say when it comes to the purpose of what our lives are going to be. When you served a king in the past, you were considered to be called a bannerman, or if you happened to be a rich person, you were a nobleman. And as such, you pledged your loyalty to that king. You agreed you were willing to follow that king anywhere that that king wanted to lead you. And you agreed that you were willing to fight and die if that what was required of you by that king. So when we think about Christ as our king, by choosing to follow him, you have agreed to do your utmost to follow his teachings. You have agreed to try and live your life in a way that emulates how Jesus lived his. You see, Christ the king was not like the other kings that you might be thinking about. Often we think about kings, we think about warrior kings of the Bible that led people into the, in the past. You think of someone like David who led the armies of Israel. We think about kings of England like Richard the Lionheart leading in the Crusades. Maybe you think about stories of mythical kings like King Arthur and his Knights of the Round Table. If you're my family, you think of the musical Hamilton and the funny little interludes with uh, King George singing his little parts in the songs, and that's where you think about a king. But perhaps you, when you think about a king, you think about someone who sits in their castle and just counts all their gold all day long. And you think about them wearing their crowns and they're adorned with the finest jewels that could be found in the kingdom. What a difference when you think about Jesus as our king. You see, our king was not a man of great military might. He didn't go out and fight to conquer worlds and lands, much to the chagrin of the Pharisees who thought he was going to come and be a warrior king as their Messiah. No, that was not our king. Our king is not a man who sat in his ivory tower and counted his wealth. Our king cared nothing for the accumulation of wealth. Instead, he cared about healing the sick and the broken. Our king is a king that served others, feeding them and tending to their physical and spiritual needs. And he urges us to follow his example and do the same. Our king is a king that loved us so much that instead of asking us to die for him, he was willing to die for us. That is our king. Now throughout history, when a king wanted more land, he would send out his, his military on conquest. He'd gather his bannermen, and they would go out and conquer new lands. Often the people that that king would come in contact with would be people that were living in small bands all their own, completely ignorant of the fact that there even was a king somewhere that was coming for them. And I think we can consider those people that we talked about earlier, the ones that have not been reached by the love of Christ, to be like those that were living in the wilderness of the past. And now a more aggressive person might draw the analogy and say, we need to go out and conquer those people just like the kings of old. But we, being the banner men and banner women of Jesus Christ the King, have to think differently. I think we can go back and think about how God called the Hebrews home as their shepherd. You see, just like Jesus once gathered his lost sheep unto him, it is our responsibility as his followers to bring those sheep of now that are lost unto him. And you might be thinking, well, pastor, how do we do that? How do we gather sheep in a world where everything seems so divisive, where everyone feels more far apart than ever? How do we bring people to Jesus when there are so many people that don't want anything to do with him or to do with us? Well, again, I say to you, we do it by showing them the love of Jesus Christ, our King. We have to be willing to meet people where they are at, just like our king met people where they were. And I don't mean that we need to go meet them in their physical place, especially right now. What I mean is this. Jesus met people wherever, he found, wherever they found themselves in their lives. He found them when they were at their lowest point. He found them when other people in society had turned their backs on them completely. He found them when they were being afflicted by all sorts of different illnesses. So for us as his banner men and women, we need to be willing to find and meet people at the same places in their lives. 
we need to be willing to go to them in their darkest hours. We need to be willing to share with them the hope and love of Christ our King when all others have turned their backs on them. And we need to do these things because it is what our King requires of us. And one final thought before I give you your challenges for this week. I know that with the recent election that we've had, there are a lot of people that are happy with the result. And there are a lot of people that are upset with the result. And there are a lot of people on both sides that are worried about the future, regardless of the result of this election. But I'd like to offer this thought for you. And I think we can keep in mind that no matter who the president of this country is, no matter who occupies the different high political offices of the land, if we remember that in spite of all of this, Jesus Christ is still king, then we can take solace and comfort in that thought. So my challenges for you this week are to consider what it means for you to personally follow Jesus Christ as your king. And what is one thing, just one thing, that you can do to help gather his lost sheep? Amen.